So, all right. Uh, good day to all of our participants in our webinar. And uh, right now, we are also live in the National Museum of the Philippines YouTube channel. So anyone is free to watch this uh, our today's program. It is my pleasure to be your uh, moderator for this webinar. I am Joseph Oranda from the Zoology Division. The National Museum of the Philippines is commemor commemorating its 120th Foundation Day and Museum Galleries Month this October. We are celebrating this month by conducting series of activities, starting with this webinar entitled, The Deep Sea Fishes and a Journey Through the Emden Deep. We also joined the world today in celebrating the World Animal Day and World Habitat Day. Before anything else, may I remind everyone to please use your complete and legal name as your Zoom ID. Keep your audio and video off during the session to lessen distraction and lagging of connections. An open forum will be facilitated at the end of all presentations. If you have questions or comments, you may send them through, uh, through our Zoom chat box and uh, YouTube live chat along with your name and designation. We will organize and ask the questions or comments during the open forum. A Google feedback form will be sent through Zoom chat box before the session ends. Certificate of attendance will be sent to the registered email once feedback form is submitted. The discussion contains two topics. The first and second speaker will discuss about the deep sea biome and the deep sea fishes worldwide, worldwide and those that are discovered within the Philippine waters, followed by the third speaker who will discuss about the Emden Deep, one of the deep sea spots here in the Philippines. Then an open forum will be organized before the awarding certificate photo op and closing remarks. To start this activity, let me introduce to you the Deputy Director General for Museums of the National Museum of the Philippines, Dr. Ana Maria Teresa P. Labrador, to give the opening remarks.
Hello, uh, good, good uh, day everyone um, and welcome. As uh, Joseph mentioned, October is Museums and Galleries Month and also our uh, month uh, when we celebrate our 120th year. So Monday, the first Monday of October is also uh, the United Nations uh, designated um, World Habitat Day. And uh, it's to assess of mainly the state of our habitats no? and on the basic rights of all to have adequate shelter. But I believe that it is not only humans who need adequate habitats, other creatures too, especially those in the deepest realm of our sea, need appropriately um, uh, protected biomes. No? By conserving their ecosystems, we also protect the animals that live in it. All the anim animals must coexist with us humans to balance the na uh, nature's ecology. So our webinar this afternoon features the endem, deep and deep sea fishes, and will open our eyes to the uh, reality of the deep and know more about the species of fish that exist in it. I know that you are all excited to learn about our, uh, our resource speakers and what they will be talking about this afternoon. Welcome, Dr. Williams, and, the, and welcome, Dr. Onda. Uh, thank you, uh, Jasmine Naren, for uh, um, organizing this with your zoology team. On behalf of our National Museum of the Philippines, um, um, I, I welcome everyone to this inspiring webinar on the deep sea fishes and a journey to the MDEM uh, deep. Uh, good afternoon. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Anna, for that wonderful opening remarks. And now to proceed on to the first topic of today's program, uh, let me introduce to you our first two speakers. Our first speaker is one of the researchers from the National Museum of the Philippines under the Zoology Division, Ms. Uh, Jasmine Marin. Then our second speaker is a renowned ichthyologist from the Smithsonian Institution and also a research associate of the National Museum of the Philippines, Dr. Jeffrey Williams. His research focuses mainly on taxonomy, systematics, and biogeography of marine fishes, especially in the Indo-Pacific regions. So let's give the presenters a digital round of applause. Thank you for the introduction, Sir Joseph, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Asmin Marin. I am a researcher here at the National Museum of the Philippines. And today, we'll be sharing with you a deep, dark secret of our oceans. I will be giving an introduction to the deep sea, while Dr. Jeff Williams will share with you information about the country's deep sea fishes. For the latter half of the webinar, Dr. Deo Onda will tell us about his experience exploring the MDEN deep. I will be going over these three topics, the zones of the deep sea, the ecosystems discovered here, and the adaptations animals had to take to survive. If you have questions anytime during the webinar, feel free to use our chat boxes here in Zoom and in other social media platforms. And when we think about the ocean, we imagine this scenery, shallow sunlit reef filled with colorful marine life or sandy or rocky beaches and intertidal zones. About 70% of our planet's surface is water of which only 5% has been explored. And this beautiful shallow region is just a small fraction of the ocean biome. The dark eerie open ocean freaks out many of us. The deep sea makes up around 90% of the ocean, and many think of it as un uninhabitable, a space hiding creepy monsters plotting to take each other. But with the invention of submersible vehicles, the deep sea became explorable, revealing fascinating life forms and unique life histories. In the past few decades, even manned expeditions to the Earth's deepest points were made possible. The deep sea is a hostile environment with near freezing temperatures, low oxygen levels, and extremely high pressure. 
the pressure in the deepest regions can reach up to a thousand times greater than the, than the surface. It is surprising that many animals have adapted to withstand this crushing force, like this alien looking with lush squid seen at 980 meters along the seafloor. Human lungs won't be able to make it past the 200 meter mark. Oceanographers categorize the midwaters into five distinct uh, regions epipelagic, mesopelagic, batipelagic, abyssopelagic, and hadal pelagic. The epipelagic zone is the region we are more familiar with. It is the area on the water surface down up to 200 meters deep. This zone receives light that allows photosynthesis to take place. And it is a highly productive area that is home to colorful fishes, sea stars, marine mammals, corals, and many other marine life. Below the epipelagic zone is the deep sea, which is divided into four zones. Each has their own unique sets of communities that are adapted to light level availability, pressure, and temperature. Starting with the mesopelagic uh, zone, it is the zone directly below the epipelagic. It is also called the twilight zone, which receives no more than a glimmer of light. Here, marine life has learned to adapt to the near darkness. Animals have characteristically large eyes in proportion to their bodies, and some can do counter illumination. Fascinatingly, this deep dark environment is home to 90% of the world's fish, measured by, by weight. Bristlenote fish alone is estimated to be a quadrillion in number, making them the most plentiful fish, plentiful vertebrate in the world. Um, reaching depths up to 4,000 meters, the bathypelagic zone is completely devoid of light. Here, many organisms learn to produce their own light. They have either lost their ability to see or are hypersensitive to the light produced by other animals. Their bodies are slimy and squishy. Some interesting residents here and visitors are the rare viper fish, angler fish, sperm whale, and the vampire squid, which is the one here in the photo. The pressure has dropped, and the pressure here is 110 times um, greater than, the, than that of the surface. And there's very little food here. Animals rely heavily on marine snow, which are drifting flakes that resemble snow, like the one you can see here in the photo with this, uh, with the vampire squid. But they're not actually snow. They are actually organic matter, like silk, poop, or decaying man, uh, animal that clump together on its way to the seafloor. Further below is the abyssopelagic zone, which can go as deep as 6,000 meters down to the seafloor. The pressure is 600 times more powerful than the surface, and only highly specialized animals can live here. Some of the residents here are the, tri the tripod fish, rat tail fish, and many species of invertebrates. The Hadal pelagic zone is the deepest reaches of the ocean. It extends from 6,000 to 10,894 meters which is the uh, deepest point in the Mariana Trench. This zone has a frigid temperature and pressure a thousand times greater than on land. Despite real limitations to life in this environment, a, a species of snailfish is found around 8,230 meters in the Mariana Trench and is considered the deepest dwelling fish ever uh, recorded. It hasn't been uh, found further down, but there are other life forms present such as microbes, crustaceans, and other invertebrates. Only a handful of people have reached the Hidal Pelagic Zone so far. One of them is our guest speaker today. So to visualize the depth of our ocean, I included here a figure of Mount, which has Mount Everest, which is the highest point on dry land at 8,848 meters above sea level. Pero kahit ilagay pala natin si Mount Everest, si deep sea, hindi niya maabot ang surface. Ganon kalalim ang Challenger Deep, which is found in Mariana Stretch. It is uh, recorded at 10,894 meters. 
The second deepest point is horizon deep of the Tonga Trench, which is 10,882. And the third deepest point is Emden Deep or Galathea Deep of the Philippine Trench at 10,540. Pero napakalaki at napakalawak ng karagatan. Uh, we're exactly in the vast expanse of the, the dark abyss. Can we see life? There are several ecosystems that were observed during the numerous expeditions in the deep. And uh, I'm going to name some of them. Abyssal Plain is a relatively flat underwater terrain that can be found up to 6,000 meters below. Most animals living in this habitat receive their energy from the marine snow. Um, while marine snow fed deep sea animals, the amount that settles at the seafloor is scarce. So carcasses of whales or whale falls that made it to the seafloor provide a face of uh, to thousands, if not millions of organisms. Depending on the size and the community that settled here, a carcass can last for months and even years. Once the flesh is consumed of a whale, which um, snails and zombie worms like species of Ocidax will dig into and eat the bones, which is around 60% fat by weight, until there are no more skeleton left on the site. Next is hydrothermal vents, which are created by water which was uh, heated up by active subterranean volcanoes and mixed with metals like iron and zinc. These minerals uh, are deposited up the seafloor, creating a distinct formation of a hydrothermal vent. These constantly spew scalding water that can reach around 400 degrees Celsius, which is far beyond the boiling point of water. Symbiotic bacteria take advantage of these minerals and convert this to energy, which is which also feeds many life forms in the deep sea. Interestingly, there are lakes underwater. They are called brine lakes and are three to eight times saltier than the ocean. It is so dense, it does not mix with the surrounding water. These brine lakes are deadly and can easily kill and pickle any organisms that may fall here. But in like uh, like in uh, hydrothermal vents, microbes have learned to utilize the, the minerals like methane and hydrogen sulfide from the hypersaline water. And when animals uh, take advantage uh, of these microbes like bivalves and polychaetes, and they feed on this bacteria by the lake's edge. This case, and as well as any other symbiotic relationships established in the many parts of the deep sea, um, prove that without this symbiotic bacteria, survival in the harsh abyssal environment may not be possible. So, um, we, these are other uh, ecosystems found underwater. So cold seeps can be found in the ocean floor where buried, buried methane and hydrogen sulfide are released through the fissures. And they are only a little cooler than hydrothermal vents. And just like in, in um, hydrothermal vents and brine lakes, animals take advantage of the energy produced by symbiotic microbes here through chemosynthesis. And like on dry land, if you strip off the earth water, you will see that the submarine environment has uh, many landforms like mountains, valleys, and canyons. And these submerged land formations influence the flow of water and nutrition and create hotspots and many habitats where animals can take shelter and forage. And last, um, there are deep, deep sea reefs in the, deep, in the deepest part of the ocean and the corals are found here and they thrive up to 6,000 meters in the ocean floor. But like in shallow water reefs, a coral, coral gardens provide shelter for other animals like sharks and echinoderms. But instead of getting energy through photosynthesis, deep sea corals feed on microorganisms that are trapped in their polyps. So as we can see, many animals have proven that they have a re remarkable capacity for adaptation, which is greatly needed in order to survive the deep sea. Adaptation is a change a species undertook to survive in its environment and becomes a trait that is passed down to the next generations. 
some of the organisms found in the deep sea are shrimps, crabs, octopus, worms, bivalves, and many other uh, organisms. To withstand the pressure, some uh, deep sea animals have highly flexible bodies and body parts. Sperm whales develop the, the, the ability to collapse its own lungs to avoid damage. Sperm whales can dive at depths of 2,000 meters in search of its favorite food, which is, this, which is the giant squid. By the way, this photo is taken here at the National Museum of Natural History. And if uh, restrictions have lifted, maybe you can come over and visit us to see our sperm whale. The next type of adaptation is called a camouflage, which is a trick used by many organisms to escape predators or do ambush attacks. Ultra black fishes can absorb available light like this Pacific black dragon. Also many deep sea fishes are red since this color can't be seen in the dark like the Dumbo octopus and whale fish and many species of crustaceans. Uh, bioluminescence is the emission of light from special cells called photophores that are used to attract food. Some use lures to attract their prey, like the angler, anglerfish. They, it can also be used to confuse predators and even communicate in the dark. An example here is the palm jelly. And like on land, uh, many deep sea animals uh, go through migration, like the lanternfish, which is um, some also of the most abundant uh, fish species, species in the deep sea. Uh, they take vertical migration from the shallow parts of 150 meters down to 2,000 meters. They feed in the shallow waters in the epipelagic zone at night and then shelter in the deep sea during daytime. Other kinds of adaptations are modified body parts, like this uh, goblin shark that was, that was found in Indora a few years ago. Some have long needle-like teeth and some exhibit gigantism like oarfish and colossal squid, which they say is so big it can eat, it can sometimes eat smaller sperm, sperm whales. Some exhibited specialized body parts like lateral lines or special sensing organs, which is used to detect vibrations or electric fields in the water. This is extremely helpful in the dark since animals cannot hunt using their eyesight. Counter illumination is a technique used by many species in the mesopelagic uh, zone, which is the area where there is still little light. It is a way to ambush prey or to trick pred predators that they, have they, that they had escaped. So animals glow on their uh, underside, and once they, po they position themselves above the predator or prey, they blend or hide in the light coming from the surface. So if this is their original color, if they do counter illumination, they're almost invisible if um, viewed from below. And some animals have established symbiotic relationships like uh, what we discussed earlier. And they can be found in many uh, deep sea ecosystems like uh, hydrothermal vents, cold seeps, and brine lakes where microbes uh, learn to convert mineral deposits to energy. And there are still discoveries being made as humans continue to descend and explore our planet's most mysterious biome. We can only expect the unexpected when it comes to life in the abyss. Organisms continue to surprise humanity with their fascinating life hacks and creepy but functional physiques. So this is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much. Salamat sa pahikinig. I'm turning over the mic to Dr. Jeff Williams, who will discuss some of the deep sea fishes found in our workers. Salamat po.
All right, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Jasmine Marin, for your uh, presentation. And now we proceed to uh, Dr. Uh, Jeffrey Williams to present his uh, piece. Okay, thank you. Share my screen. Okay. Hopefully this is coming through all right. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, marine fish diversity in the deep sea, and I'll I'll speak a bit about the the shallower sections of the deep sea as well. In order to in order to um, really examine the the deep sea, we have to go go to depth, and of course. There are only a, only a few ways that you can, can uh, get to the deep, deep, water, deep water parts of, of the ocean. Uh, the deep sea begins at about 150 meters and includes deep reefs and then all of the bathypelagic, epipelagic, mesopelagic realms that, that Jasmine spoke about in her previous, previous presentation. Um, I'm going to talk about one of the ways that my collaborators from uh, at, the, at the Smithsonian have been uh, going down to examine uh, fish diversity in the in the deep sea is using a deep deep sea submersible. Uh, she, my my collab, my collaborator Carl, Carol Baldwin has been doing a lot of work in the Southern Caribbean. So the the first part of this talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about what they've what what's been happening with the Southern Caribbean part. Of the of the deep sea area, and then we'll switch over later into uh, my work here in the Philippines. Well, by taking the uh, a deep sea uh, submersible down, you can you can examine the uh, the unusual fishes like the tripod fishes, which uh, Jasmine also mentioned. Uh, the tripod fishes are, a, are a, an interesting group in that they have evolved elongate filaments from the pectoral fins and from the uh, from the caudal fin, which allow them to basically perch like they're on a tripod above the bottom. And there in the deep sea, they can, can wait until a prey item comes, comes uh, close to them and then they can grab the prey. Because one of the major uh, problems in the deep sea, since there's, there's, uh, there's no light in the deep water areas, is finding uh, prey items to survive. Another, um, Adaptation, of course, like uh, for the deep sea, uh, is shown in this deep sea chimera. They tend to have uh, kind of gelatinous bodies because of the pressure, and they'll have elaborate, uh, uh, very, very elaborate um, sensory sensory canal systems. The sensory canal systems in, um, enable the fish to detect movement in the water. So, if a prey item swims close by. The, the movement in the water is transmitted to the to the different receptors in these in, in this sensory system. They can detect the movement and then hopefully capture capture the, the animal that's that's swimming by. Um, as you can see, they also need to make sure that once they do capture something in the deep sea, they hold on to it. And the deep sea viper fish is an example of that. They've Adapted by develop by evolutionary development of these very enlarged canine teeth in the jaws, and you can imagine that once um, once a viper fish uh, sinks these teeth into a prey item, that prey item is not going to be going away. And they're going to be they're going to be able to uh, ingest and get the nutrition from that from that prey. Well, in order to study uh, the diversity of fishes in the deep sea or the shallow shallow waters of, of, of the oceans as well, um, we need to capture specimens, preserve them, and place them into, into museum collections. Um, museum collection at the Philippine National Museum has jar collection, preserved jar collections. This is a photo of one of the jar collections of preserved specimens at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. 
the specimens are preserved in the field and then they're, um, they're placed in, ultimately placed in these jars of 70 to 75% ethanol and they'll be kept in those jars forever. So these, uh, this will allow anatomical study of these, of these fish in, in the, a laboratory setting, which you can't do in the field when you're just looking at them swimming around live. And in order to describe a species, you have to have enough information about the specimen to distinguish it from all the other known species. So these museum collections are extremely important for this. This is a specimen from one of those collections. This is a deep sea angler fish. And by having the specimen preserved in, in a museum collection, you can examine the specimen. You can see this one, how it's a very, uh, very soft bodied fish because of the deep pressures. Uh, there are no scales on, scales on the skin. And by having the specimen in hand, we were able to, the scientific community was able to determine uh, the life cycle life history cycle of, of the deep sea angler fishes. Um, because there's, it's dark, it's difficult to find, find mates, these, this is a, we found that this is a female and the female will swim around in, the, in these dark depths and the males are very small. And actually, if you see this small structure here on the, on the abdomen of this, this female, this is a male. The males will come up to the female They'll bite into the female's tissues and then they'll stay there. And the female's skin will actually grow around the, the surface of the male to, form, to kind of encapsulate it. So when the female is ready to, to uh, spawn and, and, um, really, and release, release uh, new baby fish, the male is already there. They don't have to worry about finding that male in the dark. Well, as, as Jasmine mentioned, about 71% of the earth is covered, is covered by the ocean. And, and, um, and the, the fishes occur, occur from, from at all depths, and they may be, animals may be found at all depths of the ocean. Um, the average depth of the ocean is about 4,000 meters, and the deepest depths are, are almost 12,000 meters. And because so much of the water column is inhabited by, by, by life, 90, about 95% of livable space is actually in the ocean. So it's extremely important that we understand and know what is living in the, in the oceans of the world. Well, in the, two, in the early 2000s, the development of molecular techniques enabled us to come up with a new approach to taxonomy. Uh, we're now doing an integrative taxonomic, taxonomic approach to the study of, of fish, fish taxonomy using the traditional anatomical data that we obtained from the specimens in, that are preserved in museum collections. And then we can combine the information we get from the anatomical study with new molecular data. And what we're finding is a completely new picture of species diversity with many more species of fish than we, than we ever dreamed could be in the ocean. Just in the Southern Caribbean, my collaborator found all of these cryptic species at the upper portion of, of the deep sea, um, just below the mesophotic zone. The deep reefs, of course, are a, a very diverse marine ecosystem and they weren't much more studied. So the faunal zones as we know them, uh, we have the, have the, shallow, the shallow area up, up uh, down to about from 30 to 50, down to 30 to 50 meters. And then that transitions into a twilight or mesophotic zone, which ends at about 150 meters. And previously we, we felt that this, this uh, twilight zone or the mesophotic zone just transitioned directly into a deep sea habitat. But what we found uh, when we looked, when we went and studied the fishes that live from 300 meters to 1,000 feet uh, to uh, from about 150 meters down to 300 meters, we found that there was a distinct faunal assemblage living on the, on the deep reefs in the upper part of the deep sea. This is the upper extreme of the deep sea. And when we looked at these, we found that these fish 
are similar to the shallower water fishes, but they're totally different species in this area, and it's a totally different ecosystem. So the mesophotic area does not transition directly into the deep sea. There's previously unrecognized zone that bridges the gap. And what this has now been called is this area here from, a, from about 130 feet down to three meters down to 300 meters. This is the rare ephogic zone because light is very scarce, but there's still a little bit of light reaching, reaching this zone. So it's now called the rare ephogic zone. And my, my colleague, Carol Baldwin, has, has, uh, has now published this and it's, it's been documented. They also added a very shallow zone at the top, the, the altiphotic zone. But for the deep reef area, the rare ephotic zone is now a recognized faunal zone. Well, now let me switch over to the Philippines. And the, and the Philippine area is interesting because this is the most diverse area in the world in, the ter in terms of the number of species of fishes. And another way that we can, can observe and collect um, deep sea fishes in the Philippines is by going to Philippine markets. The Philippine fish markets are just some of the most amazing markets in the world. There are more species of fish found in the Philippine fish markets than in any other country in the world. I started working, working on fishes in the Philippines in 1995 and then I started working on the market, extensively on the market fishes in 2011. And what we do is we, uh, we work with our Philippine collaborators and we go to the fish markets all over the Philippines and we purchase as many fish species as possible from these markets, including the deep sea fishes. Well, since, night, since, 2020, since 2011, we've collected over 3,300 samples. And this includes over 1,350 distinct species of fishes. And we know that there's potentially over 2,000 species of fish that we can find in these Philippine markets. Now, many of the fish that we find in these markets are actually new species uh, that have never been, never been, been known before. And we have the advantage of being able to have, have specimens that we preserve and get fresh photographs from the markets because many of these fish come to the markets in very good, fresh condition. This is a specimen that, that I collected in, Iloi, in an e, a market in Iloilo. It's in 2013, I collected this new deep water species of Kelodoperca in the Iloilo market. And I subsequently named this Kelodoperca santosi, which was described from that Iloilo specimen. This has the reddish color of, of the deep sea, of a typical deep sea specimen. And they're found in deeper water. But we, since they come from a market, we, we don't know exactly how deep the fishermen were fishing when they collected these specimens. We've made some other amazing discoveries in deep water species in the tilefish genus Branchiostegus. This, this specimen here it turned, that, that I collected in a fish market in Palawan, turns out is a new species of the genus Branchiostegus. Uh, previously, we thought it, it belonged to a wide-ranging species, but when we did the integrative taxonomic study and compared this specimen, uh, the molecular components of it for the species, and added that to the anatomical, it turned out that this was, in fact, a distinct new species of fish that we are still in the process of describing. Uh, there have been some questionable species of, in the genus Branchiostegus that were known only from the original description of the species. This one, Branchiostegus vitatus, was described in 1928, but it was not until 2016 on, a, on my market fish uh, expedition to, to southeastern Luzon in the Bicol region that we discovered this specimen again. We rediscovered it, and it turns out it's a very distinctive species, and there's no question that it's a good species. The BFAR has been, been doing work around, around uh, Luzon and other air parts of the Philippines, and they found another questionable species, uh, Branchiostegus ilocanus, which had not been known since 1926. And then just a few years ago, uh, they discovered this new spe this species, or specimens of this species in northern Luzon. So many 
as, uh, as Jasmine mentioned, many deep sea fishes have developed different kinds of adaptations to the deep, such as bioluminescent glands. Uh, the glow belly has, has a bioluminescent gland across the, from the belly all the way to the caudal fin. The lantern fishes, which migrate, uh, have daily, daily vertical migrations, have luminescent organs on, on the head and then photophores along the ventral parts of the body. Uh, the photophores can be patterns that are distinct and, uh, um, and are often species specific and help us distinguish the different species. Many, fish, many deep sea fishes often are red in color, such as the Antigonia capros. Uh, this is a bright red. It's also laterally compressed, so it's a very, very skinny fish, uh, making it difficult, difficult to, to, um, to detect in, in the deep waters of the deep sea, and making it, helping it to avoid becoming a prey item. The pancake batfish is a pinkish colored fish, uh, but this one is flattened from top to bottom, so it looks kind of like a pancake as it walks across the bottom of the, of the ocean. Many deep sea fishes have, have uh, gelatinous bodies that adapt, that are an adaptation to the great water pressure at deep, at deep depths. Uh, the Pacific jelly nose that I collected at a fish market in northern Panay can be seen here. Uh, the, the, it's called the jelly nose because it has this gelatinous projection on the snout. And we don't really know what this projection, what the function of this is, but it's uh, very distinctive. And then we have the eel-like soft-bodied eels that also burrow down into the bottom to avoid detection by predators. I'll just finish this up by pointing out that, that although we're starting to make advances in our knowledge of of the deep sea and even the shallow water fishes of, of the Philippines, there's still so much work to be done. We've collected hundreds, what are probably hundreds of new species of fish in the fish markets that we have yet to describe. So if any budding taxonomists are out there, the discipline could certainly use your efforts in the, in the realm of fish taxonomy. Thank you. All right. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Williams, for the very informative presentation. Proceeding on to our next topic, our third speaker is an Associate Professor and Deputy Director for Research from the University of the Philippines Marine Science Institute. His field of expertise and research focus is on host symbiont interaction, microbial biogeography, diversity, dynamics and trophic interaction, and consequences of changing conditions. Furthermore, he is known as the first Filipino to make the first man descent into Emden Deep. And it is said to be the third deepest point on earth, which is actually found in the Philippines. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Deo Florence Onda. Good morning, everyone. Um... First, I'd like to thank the National Museum for the invitation, but I also apologize if I'm not able to join you live today. Uh, probably by now, we're already in the middle of the South China Sea in the West Philippine Sea uh, on our way to Pagas Island. Um, uh, we are uh, conducting an expedition to actually refurbish our marine station there, uh, which I will also be sharing to you later in the talk. Um, so let, just, let me just share to you some slides. So my presentation today is entitled uh, A Journey to the End in Deep. Uh, this is just to, to share to you what we have found in the deepest part of the Philippines, which is actually the Philippine Trench, the End in Deep particularly. Um, before I start, I would like to emphasize that when we probably personally, when we talk more about explorations, we look up into the sky and not really imagine that there's another big undiscovered world down there. Uh, as Paul Snellgrove said, we know more about the surface of the moon and Mars than we do about the deep sea floor, despite the fact that we have yet to extract a gram of food, a breath of oxygen, or a drop of water from those bodies. You know, we are a maritime people, and this is to also hopefully demonstrate to you how important our connection to the seas um is 
Um, so the interest for early explorations of the lowest points on Earth can be likened actually to the early explorations of, of space. Uh, the, the earliest account was that of Magellan trying to measure the bottom of the Pacific Ocean by sending a rope with a weight on it, but of course they did not succeed. Um, in 1872, a global expedition which gave birth to the modern oceanography um, was conducted uh, via the HMS Challenger, which resulted in many, many discoveries in the marine environment. Um, it was followed by another German expedition, the, Valdiv the Valdivia Expedition. The Enden Deep was discovered in 1927 by a German research vessel called Enden. In 1930, the first deep sea crew descent on board the bathysphere successfully reached around 435 meters. By 1948, Otis broke this record by reaching 1,317 meters. In 1960, the first crewed uh, descent that went to the Mariana Trench, uh, Picard and Walsh were able to uh, uh, set a record of uh, by reaching 10,730 meters of the Challenger Deep. In 2012, James Cameron uh, went there alone and then uh, reached the deepest part of the Mariana Trench via the Deep Sea Challenger. And in 2019, Victor Riscovo set a new record by visiting uh, 10,925 meters, the deepest part actually of the, of the Mariana Trench. Uh, he was also the first human to, by that time, to actually visit the five, the deepest trenches in the five continents. And in 2021, um, I was invited to to visit the for the first time uh, to conquer the Endem Deep. So the Endem Deep is a uh, trench uh, that is found in the eastern side of the Philippines. So here's the map. The the Endem Deep is located here within the Philippine Trench. Yeah, the the the, the Endem Deep is nearest in Shargao. And um, it was discovered in 1927, but only uh, studied in detail in 1951 um, by, by the Danish group on board the research vessel Galathea. Uh, that's why the Endem Deep is also called the Galathea Deep and sometimes Philippine Deep. But it was only in 2021. So I was invited by this man, Victor Viscovo. He's a visionary uh, American explorer. He has summited the seven peaks of the world and already visited the deepest trenches in the world. He's the main, main sponsor. Um, he owns and he's the guy, he's the man behind this very, very nice technology of the DSV limiting factor. So the DSV limiting factor is a submersible itself that we used uh, to go to the to the end of the it is the it is uh, the first IMO certified sorry, certified deep sea submersible. Um, one of the key features of this submersible is that so this is the interior, and one of the key features is that it is this ball. This is where the passengers are located. You've got the pilot here and the passenger here. Um, it is a uh, marvel on its own, primarily because uh, it can withstand the the greatest pressures i think when it was being built it was tested in a in a in an environment simulated at fourteen thousand meters below so that's how powerful that's how uh, tough this this uh, submersible is um and one of the key features is this titanium ball the the, the compartment where the people are located is actually made up of 90 millimeters thick uh, titanium with almost a uh, perfect uh, spherical shape um, the DSSB limit, the DSV limiting factor has its support vessel called the DSSB pressure drop. So this is the uh, submersible and this is the vessel. The, 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 the submersible is actually docked here on the rear end of the ship and it's the one that brings it anywhere in the world. Um, they have been setting the Caledon Ocean which manages the entire uh, expedition. Uh, is has been setting records. Uh, they have gone and done a lot of expeditions all over the world, and one of those is actually conquering the end of this year. Um, yeah, so in March 2021, I was invited by Caledon Oceanic uh, to ask to join Victor Viscovo to explore and conquer the end of the in the Philippine Trench. And I am actually also very proud to say that I was not the only Filipino on board. Half of the crew, including a mapper, 
uh, who's not here, uh, uh, are Filipinos. Uh, I felt at home on that ship <laughs> primarily because Kababayans are everywhere. <laughs> and I was very happy to do it. They were even more excited than me, than I was uh, when uh, uh, during during the when we were re when we were about to to do the the dive there it was it was fun it was i was happy actually to do it with them so this beach um we started at around 6 30. um so we needed i needed to fly to guam because the, the ship cannot come to the philippines so I, uh, the, the expedition started in guam then we sailed through the pacific ocean going to the philippine church so on the morning of march 23 we started the descent to the philippine uh, trench or the MDM deep at 6 30 in the morning and we were able to re we we reached the uh, uh we touched the bottom at around 10 30 in the morning so this is a uh the raw foot footage from inside the vessel when we were about to to, re to reach the bottom it took four hours it took the, the entire journey took actually four hours going down um yeah, so those are some of the short conversations, right? <laughs> While down there. Um, just let me show you these two. Surface, LF, depth, one, zero, zero, four, five. Life support, good. At bottom, repeat. So this was the very exact moment when we actually reported to the surface that we have reached the bottom. Um, so what did we find there? Um, just like any other, just like the other reports in the other trenches, uh, the deep sea is actually not lifeless. Uh, there are there are several organisms that we found, including this tube forming sea anemone called Galathian tenum. So they're like a, a, a guard. Beautiful, you know and quite amazing to see at that depth. We also found a lot of amphipods feasting on this uh, carcass of a mackerel that we sent down there. Uh, they, they, most of these are actually here in Belea. Um, so we were able to collect some of these amphipods. We put a trap in the autonomous uh, uh, equipment that we sent down there. And we donated, we've already donated the specimens to the National Museum. So hopefully the public will also be able to see it in the future. Um, we also found this deep sea jellyfish, <laughs> uh, but we did not find any fish at that depth. And I think my co-speakers or the speakers before me uh, will already explain to you that uh, many are suggesting that the fish cannot actually survive the pressure at that depth. However, uh, as part of the scoping and safety precautions, uh, the team was sending landers or autonomous uh, equipment in the different depths just to, to make sure that everything is safe <laughs> before we send people down. They needed to do scoping. They needed to situate to, to, to know the situation down there first. So in, in, in some of those deployments at 6,000 meters, they were able to find a lot of fish. For example, this snailfish that they found at that 6,000 meters. And then we have the pakikara or eel pot. Um, so this is the, the eel pout actually feasting on small amphipods that were eating the carcass of the, of the mackerel. You also have this very beautiful flamboyant <laughs> crustacean and some of the ass fish or cusk eel. So the, who are also feasting on the amphipods that were eating the, the carcass of the, the mackerel that we sent down there. Um, but sadly, we did not only find living things we also found a lot of imprints of human contamination and these are actually plastics um there was this funny story when we reached the bottom i saw this white this thing that this white floating material and i at first i thought it was a deep sea jellyfish i told victor yeah there's a jellyfish and in that direction uh let's go near and you know see what it is and then as we went nearer, it became more apparent that it was actually a plastic bag. <laughs> that was very sad. I was I was uh, uh, telling everyone that the entire experience itself was very surreal. You know, the, the feeling of going into Mars, the feeling of being out of this world. But once I saw this plastic bag, it just pulled me back to reality that it was not out of this world, that I was still on Earth. So from being on Mars to 
going back to Payatas. That was the feeling. You know? um, we saw a lot. We saw a lot of, of, of plastics. I think every so often you will encounter a debris or a pile of debris uh, in the bottom of the Philippine Trench. And that's very sad to me. Um, the entire expedition itself was classified by the DFA as non-MSR. Therefore, there's no uh, systematic scientific investigation that was embedded in that expedition. Um, the idea is for that expedition to inspire more researchers to actually do more uh, targeted or designed experiments to explore the deep sea environments. However, um, despite that, despite not being an MSR, it was still able to fulfill several goals. One, it increased the awareness of the Filipinos of our maritime domain, especially that we are an 80, uh, we, we are 82 percent waters. When we at least now Filipinos will be able to say that our, the vastness of our waters do not only does, does not only go far, but it also goes deep. Um, uh, it emphasized the importance of science and contributions of scientists to national development and growth and patrimony because it allows us to actually become more aware of our maritime domain. It also provided the sense of pride to the Filipinos by and belongingness by appreciating more a previously unknown marine heritage. And it highlighted environmental issues such as plastics pollution by visualizing the extent and the gravity of the problem. Imagine finding plastic at 10,000 meters and who knows probably some of these plastics were used by our parents or grandparents, you know, which traveled up long and far to actually reach the bottom of the Philippine Trench. Last month, we, we celebrated Manamo, the Maritime and Archipelagic Nation Awareness Month. But as an extension of that celebration, let me just sh share to you um, uh, some of the things that we are doing in order to further understand our marine environment in the Philippines. In the past expeditions that we had, including this uh, our expedition that we are doing now, we're looking into plastic pollution. And our past expeditions showed us that even the isolated islands in the West Philippine Sea are full of trash. So this, are the, this is the situation of most of the islands that we have in the West Philippine Sea. And it is not different from the stories that we have on the mainland in the coast. And in many research uh, projects that we are implementing, trying to do baselining of how much plastics is actually out there, we found that plastics pollution is actually everywhere. You go to Manila, south of Luzon, north of Luzon, even in the coast of Palawan, which is considered the last ecological frontier, you will find plastics. And... Um, the number one type of plastics that we found are still the thin plastic wraps, product labels and packaging, and foam styro fragments, and strings, ropes, and fishing lines in Palawan because of the predominance of fishing activities. Um, so what's next for us? We've already count, uh, conquered uh, the deepest part of the Philippines. Is that is it? Would it be the last time that we'll be able to do it? Uh, you know to. To, to also emphasize, it, it is difficult for Filipino marine scientists to do marine scientific research in the Philippines, primarily because we are also limited with resources. Um, until now, we do not have a, an open ocean, deep sea uh, research vessel dedicated really for research. Although we have several uh, floating platforms, these are not dedicated for research and are of multiple use. Um, there's also a need to increase capacity, to do more capacity building and build more infrastructures. You know? So as a, uh, to, 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 uh, to, to address some of these gaps, the UPMSI has been lobbying to the government for more support. And in 2019, we were granted a uh, big uh, project uh, called Upgrading Capacity Infrastructure and Assets for MSR in the Philippines or Upgrade CIA. And that's also the same project that is funding our expedition right now, um, which has four, uh, four objectives. One is to refurbish the station in Pagasa. So we will now have the Pagasa Island Research Station, and that's what we are refurbishing with this expedition. Um, we are also establishing uh, more uh, the National Academic Research Fleet or NARC Fleet. The idea is to have more dedicated research vessels in the different parts of the country. We're also continuing doing more local marine scientific research activities and also increasing capacity by training HEIs and NGAs. So 
the project I'm leading is actually the establishment of the National Academic Research Fleet. We are now in the process of procuring four more research vessels. That's very exciting. Um, the idea is to actually have one dedicated to the West Philippine Sea, to the Philippine Rice, to the Sulu Sea, Visayan Sea, and the Sulu West Sea. Um, it is a long-term plan. Uh, so we've developed this long-term sustainability plan until 2035. So I am excited for the developments in the marine sciences and ocean research in the next few years. And hopefully those listening uh, in this uh, webinar right now will be able to join us in those expeditions. And also hopefully to have a more, uh, to have more collaborations with the National Museum. You know? uh, we will also be launching this uh, website of the Nile Fleet in the coming months. Um, I'd like to emphasize that to understand our maritime domain, from the surface to the bottom, we do not only need scientists. We need more educators and researchers. We need more uh, uh, geologists. We need more climate scientists. We need more marine engineers. We need more science-based managers and policymakers. We need more social scientists. We all of us need to work together to, uh, for the protection, utilization, pro sustainable utilization, and preservation of our marine resources. So the next few decades or the next few years for me, the Philippines is actually in a sea of opportunities and hopefully more younger scientists and more younger Filipinos will be interested to actually take a path of becoming a marine scientist or a marine researcher in the Philippines. Um, we've also just entered the decade of the ocean and I'd like to remind you to hopefully contribute to the protection and sustainable utilization of this resource that we have in the next decade. Uh, so with that, I'd like let me thank you, some of these people who have actually helped me and facilitated uh, in mounting the expedition, and also to Marivi <laughs> for helping me with the specimens. Uh, the specimens are now donated to the National Museum, um, and also to the National Museum for the invitation today. Uh, so, so with that, I'd like to to thank you again for the opportunity, and uh, hopefully you have a good day, and hopefully you were able to learn something from this talk. Bye bye. Thank you. For all our participants, that Dr. Deo Onda will not be available to join us in our open forum as he is currently going on an expedition in the West Philippine Sea. So, tuloy tuloy po yung kanyang. Uh, research nevertheless you can still send your uh, you can send your uh, queries to our zoom chat box and youtube live chat and we will collate all your queries for dr onda and his answers will be sent via your registered email so so may i request our available available speakers right now miss jasmine Marin and uh, dr jeffrey williams to answer questions from our participants Okay, so meron tayong isang question dito. What is the deepest dwelling fish discovered in the world? Anyone from our speaker? Uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Jeff? She's got me stumped there. I, I have known that before, but I've, I forgot what that... Um, Well, I can't recall offhand the, the name of the deepest one. It was, what was it? I think the specimens in the, in the Smithsonian Institution's collection, but I can't remember which one it is at this point. Sorry. <laughs> um, I've, I've just checked it um, online and the deepest 
uh, species that they've seen uh, so far in the Mariana uh, Trench is a snailfish. Correct me if I'm wrong, um, Jeff. It's Sudoliparis yep. suire, and it's yeah, that sounds right. That that's the the most recent um, discovery, and it's still the deepest uh, species that was found underwater. Right. All right. Thank you thank so you much. Thank you for the assist uh, on that one. Meron din tayong question from our uh, participant and her name is yung first kanina. Ayan. Lowin, from, this is from uh, Lowina Marie. Okay. Why do deep sea creatures look weird? Huh? Does the pressure at the bottom of the ocean a factor? Yeah, that... A factor? It, yeah, it, it actually is a, a combination of the, the deep pressure and the, and, the, and the absence of light. So the fishes had to evolve um, structures and mechanisms to, um, to survive at that kind of depth. Uh, it's, it's almost impossible to, you know, for, carb, for a calcium carbonate to come out of solution at these great depths. So the fishes are very soft bodied and and uh, there's there are very few fish with any kind of scale scalation on the body because of the pressures uh, inhibiting that. And then, uh, as I mentioned before, they they have to uh, adapt to that condition and develop ways to feed, such as the extremely elongate uh, canine teeth that allow them to once they grab a prey item, uh, the prey can't get away. So there's just all sorts of adaptations to live in the dark and the high pressure that makes them very, look very strange and weird. All right, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Williams. And uh, another question from our participants. And this question is from Justin Benete Milado. Uh, can you comment on the current status of the Philippine Marine Studies? Are we still a baby or are we catching up? Um, actually, I think everybody is still a baby. <laughs> uh, what we found once we, once we uh, incorporated the genetic sampling and the genetic results with the, with the uh, morphological uh, uh, kinds of studies of things, the numbers of species out there is just immense. There's so many undescribed species in the oceans of the world now that we just don't have, have nearly enough taxonomists out there in order to, to describe all the new species that we actually know exist uh, based on the molecular data that are being accumulated in the Barcode of Life database, which is a free online database uh, called BOLD um, that anyone can sign up for and, and and look at the molecular results of the, particularly the, uh, the CO1 gene, uh, we can see that, that there are clusters within a single species that are really different species. So, so yes, the Philippines is a baby in terms of marine science, particularly taxonomy, but so is everybody else in the world. So we're, we're still in an age of discovery, which seems amazing, um, after a couple of hundred years of taxonomic study that we're, we're just, we seem to be just scratching the surface of, of our knowledge of, of the taxonomy of both fishes and all the other organisms which are even uh, more poorly studied than fishes. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Williams. And uh, another question, Po. Ayan. From Jamil Christian Lisa. Okay, so... Do deep sea creatures are, are also affected by climate change? In what way and how can we conserve their environment? Well, uh, um, I guess I can speak to that as well. Um, the deep sea fishes are affected to some extent. Certainly, um, the upper portions of the deep sea, the raritic, uh, section and the upper portions 
um, what we're what we're finding is that uh, the warming of the oceans is going deeper and deeper into the upper realms of the deep sea. So we're finding that uh, fishes that could survive in the rarephotic zone and the mesophotic zones are, have, are now having to move farther to the north uh, to get to keep the cool to keep the uh, to stay in water that's that's suitable for them to live in. So it is affecting them in that respect but certainly not as severely as the shallow water reefs and corals that are coral bleaching and dying because of the, of the hot, hot water in the, in the tropical seas. And um, climate change is, is a real problem and the world's, the, the countries of the world are really not doing that much to, um, to mediate the impact of man's impact on the climate. Uh, there's not much we can do unless everybody in the world tries to tries to help out and do their bit to to help help minimize the uh, impact of climate change. But um, I'm, I don't see that happening right now. I don't see countries making the moves that are needed in order to uh, to stem the the global warming that we're seeing as more and more ice. Um, ice melts in the Arctic and the northern and southern southern uh, tips of the world. Uh, we'll see what happens. And uh, if I may add, um, Jeff is right. Um, climate change um, is a big factor uh, affecting the environment and the marine ecosystems right now. And na nakita naman natin kanina dun sa video ni Sir Deo na they, that they also saw plastic pollution it can be one of the factors affecting climate change. Because she asked, yung, yung, yung participant natin asked kung ano daw yung pwede nilang gawin. So, maliliit na bagay uh, that we can do is to uh, minimize our um, uh, use of single-use plastics. I think that's the easiest that we can do and also to um, ask our governments to, to do something about it because this are big corporations working together. Yun yung makakatulong sa pag-reduce ng effects ng anthropogenic uh, factors affecting climate change. So yun po. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Um, uh, this comes from uh, from our participants again. Uh, uh, Jal wants to know how strong the pressure is underwater. Can someone describe it from our speakers? Gano kalakas? How strong? Ano ba? May, may, parang may nabasa ako na it's like if you are in the deepest part of the ocean on the trenches, uh, the pressure is a thousand times uh, greater than on the surface of um, in, in, in the land. So it's like ano daw, parang meron kang 60 fighting jets on top of you. Ganon kabigat yung pressure. So, hindi basta-basta makakapunta ang tao doon. Yung submersible na ginamit nila Sir Onda uh, was tried and tested. Uh, otherwise, hindi siya mag-work. Hindi siya makakapunta doon sa, sa deepest part of the ocean. And ano pala yun, it varies from um, which region Kung, uh, kung nasaan yung, yung submersible. So the, the higher you are sa, sa column, sa water column, mas less siyempre yung pressure. Pero as you go down, mas mabigat na. And, and it's really a miracle. It's really fascinating kung papaano nabubuhay dun yung mga animals. Kasi can you imagine jet fighters on top of you? Parang ganun daw ka-extreme ka yung pressure dun. Pero sila parang they can move freely and they are surviving on the deepest parts of of, of the earth. Yeah. All right, thank you so much. And uh, a question from uh, USM Mahmoud. Okay, question po, why sea animals are much larger in the deep sea than in the shallower or inland? Well, actually the, the species of fishes that occur in the deep sea are really uh, really not all that large compared to the shallow water water species. Uh, when you compare a great white great white shark to 
to a chimera, I mean, the chimera is fairly large. There are some deep water, deep water sharks, but for the most part, you have larger specimens up in the, up in the shallows, uh, all the, the manta rays and the, um, the drift ocean sea fish, drift fish, things that are very large, can be very large. So I would say that their larger fish are more predominant in the shallower waters, uh, but you certainly get some fish that are, are on the larger side in the deep sea, but most of them are, are not, not quite as large as you find in the, in the shallower waters. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Williams. Uh, another question from UPLB, Kent Elson Sarsogon. Tama ba? Okay. Sargon, sorry. Hey. Hi, Jasmine and Jeff. What are some of the challenges you see when it comes to doing research on deep sea fishes or marine fishes in general in the Philippines? What advice can you give for folks wanting to pursue biodiversity studies? Example, uh, taxonomy and uh, biogeography, focusing on marine fishes. Any advice? Okay. Uh Nabanggit din ito ni Dr. Deo kanina. Uh, thank you for the question, Kent. Ang challenges na nabanggit niya sa marine research sa Pilipinas ay yung kakulangan sa equipment. And um, ang maganda dito is they're starting, at least UP, MSI, is starting to acquire mga ships and equipment both for fieldwork and sa laboratory to conduct mga marine um um, marine explorations and experiments. And um, advice na we, we can give to um, those people who would like to pursue studies in biodiversity, hindi lang siguro for marine. Uh, there are, actually nakahagulat, pero sa Pilipinas, we have several courses. After you graduate, uh, well, if you're pursuing uh, college, you can take biology, uh, Marami namang nag-offer ng biology uh, courses across the Philippines. And then you can uh, specialize further. So you can take a master's degree in uh, many of our prestigious universities. So we have uh, the UP campuses and we have Siliman uh, University in the Visayas and um, Marie, um, Mindanao State University. So many um, universities here that's offering. And... Kung hindi ka pa rin, uh, if you if you think you can still go uh, beyond yung yung pag-aaral mo, you can still get uh, doctoral uh, studies also here and abroad. So maybe Jeff can add uh, some from his experience. Uh, yes, uh, certainly there's 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 a huge amount of work that needs to be done by taxonomists all over the world. Um, the biggest problem in, in, taxonom in being a taxonomic researcher is finding an institution that is focused and appreciates the value of taxonomic research to the world. Um, frequently, we'll hear a lot about how important biodiversity, uh, it, biodiversity species richness is in the world. But when it comes to hiring professors and universities, that may not be the top person on the list that they're looking for um, as a professor or an instructor at, at a university. So changing the views of, of administrators and, and valuing the importance of, of, tax, of the, the value of having a taxonomist able to uh, distinguish the species to uh, to assist fisheries with the identification of all the species that are being, being utilized for fishery purposes. Uh, there are tremendous numbers of ways that taxonomic data can be used to help everybody in the world. Um, I, it, I just encourage people that if you really enjoy taxonomy and enjoy uh, discovering new species of whether it's fish or invertebrates or other organisms, uh, you have to really be dedicated to it and you have to basically follow that dream and, and then hope that you get lucky and, and you're one of the ones that are selected to, <laughs> for those positions and you know, that are 
at the universities and in government so that you'd be able to, to fulfill that dream. And I wish you all the luck in the world because we taxonomists are, are desperately needed around the world. All right, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jeff Williams. We uh, have a question dito from our participants again. And uh, by the way, this will be the last question now. Uh, entertain natin. All right. Uh, from Redentor, is there a deep sea species with potential medicinal use so far? Any studies about? Well, there there have been there have been some um, uh, clinical trials and medicinal uh, uh, extracts from deep sea organisms, uh, mostly in the um, anti cancer realm. Um, but you can imagine how hard it is just to collect a deep sea, <laughs> deep sea specimen of any kind of animal. So um, potentially, yes, there are, are potential medicinal um, drugs that could be obtained from deep sea organisms, um, but it's very difficult to, to study those. All right, thank you so much. Sige, pwede pa tayong mag-entertain ng uh, questions. Last two questions na. Okay, from Mariel Grace Pialago. Okay. Hello everyone. Is it true that the deep sea ocean produces weird scary noises? Wow. <laughs> Uh, I don't know about that one. Yeah, I don't know either. Maybe uh, we can ask Dr. Deo to answer this. Yes, yes. He was the one who yeah. got to the deepest parts of, uh, of the sea. Okay. So next question po. How about shipwrecks and artifacts on the seafloor? No, meron ba? Does the Philippine also produces efforts in conserving this uh, no? uh yeah we have uh, we have a mm -hmm. division here at the national museum who are uh, studying deep sea uh, mar marine maritime artifacts so um, if you're interested you can also uh, go, go ahead and email our um, mar what that mar much d maritime and underwater heritage uh, division so uh, they can answer your queries about our shipwrecks, um, yung mga historical. Ayan. All right, thank you so much. So, since hindi nasagot yung question kanina for the Yonda, um, tignan natin to again. Meron tayong uh, question from Redentor. Okay, is evolutionary forces still operating among fishes in the deep sea? Uh, definitely. I mean, there's uh, evolutionary forces are working on everything, whether it's deep or shallow all the time. It's just a question of, of uh, the, the period of time over which those evolutionary forces work on, a, on any given population in any given area. I mean, we're, we're still discovering new species of fishes in the, in the deep sea. So um, obviously things are still evolving. They're there will be evolutionary forces working on, on all of the organisms. It's just a question of, of when those forces are strong enough to push, push a population up to a, a recognizable species level versus say just a, a, a population variation uh, among, within, a, within a given species where they can still interbreed freely, but, um, but there's slight population variations. But once they get to the point of full species, then there's no longer the, the interbreeding between the different populations and it becomes a distinct species. All right, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Williams. Uh, thank you for those who participated in our open forum, but due to our limited time, we will entertain questions after this event through email. But you can still send your questions to our Zoom chat box and we will endorse them to our speakers and their answers will be sent to you via your registered email. 
Now on the last part of our program, we will now proceed to the awarding of certificates. So to our speakers, Ms. Jasmine Meren, Dr. Jeffrey Williams, and uh, Dr. Deo Florence Onda, this certificate of appreciation is hereby awarded to you for your invaluable time and effort as a speaker during the Deep Sea Fishes and a journey through the MDEM Deep webinar held on October 4, 2021, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. via Zoom meeting. Given this date, given this fourth day of October 2021 in the National Museum of the Philippines, Manila, Thank signed you very, by Mark. Very much. Right. Thank you. So, uh, all right. Um, once again, to our uh, speakers, we thank you for sharing your experience and knowledge on your field of expertise. We are very much grateful for all the learnings and takeaways from your, from your discussions. Uh, may I call Ma'am Marvin Manuel Santos to give her message? Uh, hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, medyo, this is just a very short message of the National Museum of the Philippines, deepest gratitude and appreciation to Dr. Deo Florence Onda for the samples donated from the Emden Deep to the National Museum and to Dr. Jeff Williams for donating the books and other publications to the National Museum. So on behalf of our Director General, Jeremy Barnes and uh, Deputy Director General I, for Museums, Dr. Ana Maria Teresa P. Labrador, we really thank you to the, to, and we are really very uh, grateful for helping us and for facilitating uh, the National Museum uh, in everything, and yes, thank you so much. What I can, what can I say? But thank you so much to Dr. Deo and Dr. Jeff Williams. Dr. Jeff Williams donated uh, three pallets of books and publications from the Smithsonian. Thank you. Kudos. All right, so thank you so much, Ma Marvin. And before we end our program, may I request everyone to please turn on your video camera for a photo opportunity, All right? Ready na? Okay, you ready? One, two, smile. Okay. Another one? Another one, another one daw, another one. Okay, another one. Open your cameras. Ready? One, two, three. Okay. Now to officially end this program, may I request the Senior Researcher of the Zoology Division, Dr. Jo Maria Cebes, to deliver the closing remarks.
Thank you again to all our amazing speakers, Dr. Jeffrey Williams, Ms. Jasmine Marin, and Dr. Dale Onda. Today has been a very interesting webinar, learning about the deep sea ecosystem and all the marine organisms that are living in it. Um, a very appropriate way to celebrate World Habitat Day and World Animal Day. Um, I hope everyone learned a lot today. I know I did. Um, we heard about whale falls, hydrothermal vents, brine lakes, uh, all these deep sea adaptations like counter illumination, all these different types of deep sea uh, animals uh, like the tripod fish and the deep sea viper fish, and even how they have adapted in terms of their coloration, like red is a good color to be uh, in if you're living in deep sea because it's invisible in the deep sea and even having soft or gelatinous bodies. And of course, um, how scientists like Dr. Jeff Williams uh, studies these uh, deep sea diversity such as collecting fish uh, uh, vouchers in Philippine markets. And finally, it is always a pleasure to hear from Dr. Onda about his deep sea adventure in the MDEN deep. So, um, yeah, so it's very, very interesting and I've learned a lot. I hope everyone has learned a lot. And as we end this afternoon, uh, we also like to thank everyone who helped make this webinar happen. Everyone from the Museum Services Division, our IT people, the Zoology Division people, and of course, our lively moderator, Joseph. So in behalf of the National Museum of the Philippines, uh, thank you everyone for attending and hope to see you again in our next webinar. And enjoy the rest of your Monday. Maraming salamat po. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Aceves. Uh, please don't forget to answer the feedback form sent through our Zoom chat box. All right. So again, thank you very much for joining us today. It's a pleasure having you all this afternoon, and I hope everyone enjoyed this program. And again, everyone, God bless and keep safe.